はい、あ、DJ ムーシュー、おい、おい、はい、ほな、これクーリアダイ、right? He died? クーリアダイ。When? Ah, like yesterday or something, right? Seriously? Yeah. Well, okay, okay. Did I tell you about what he did with what? cooking with Coolio? What he did to me? What did he do to you? I, we'll talk about it later, but I don't give a <laughs> owes me money anyway. <laughs> who does, again, who doesn't owe you money? All right. Uh, I don't talk about it. <laughs> All right, so for this class, uh, project one is going to be due this Sunday coming up. Again, we have the extra office hours on this Saturday at 3 p.m. as opposed to Piazza. That'll be on Gates, I think, the fifth floor. Um, we reserved out the little cutouts uh, there. Um, homework three will be due on uh, October 9th. And then, I can't believe it's already here, but the midterm is coming up on the 13th. That'll be in class in here. Uh, and then I'll have more details about this on uh, starting talk discussing next week. There will be a practice exam that are released, and then a, there'll be a web page with, with all the material and additional information that'll be covered. Okay? Any questions about any of these things for you guys? All right, cool. So, where are we at in the course? Uh, again, we're going up the, the, the stack, uh, the different layers of the database system. So now we're up here in operator execution. So now we're actually going to talk about, since we know how to store the data on disk, we know how to then bring it into memory. We know then how to access it the, at the lowest level, like how to scan tables, how, how to access th things through indexes. Now we're actually going to talk about how to execute queries. After all this, we're, we're finally here. Um, so the, the next four lectures are going to be covering sort of the, the sort of four, four key or two, three key ideas that we could care about. We'll start off talking about how we're actually going to implement the algorithms that you would have in our query plan, how to do sorting which, and aggregations, which is today, how to do joins, and other types of uh, relational operators. Then we'll talk about how do you pass data within your query plan as you execute it. And then we'll talk about the implementation of the database system. How do you maintain either multiple threads, mul multiple processes, uh, and, and you know, e execute these queries following the different processing models. OK? So, we need to talk a little bit about what a query plan actually looks like. So we, start, we started off this semester talking about relational algebra. We, and I said at some point that, oh, well, you take a SQL query and you can convert it into a relational algebra equivalent. And that's what the database system is going to execute. In actuality, what happens is that the, the, the SQL query is going to get converted to an abstract syntax tree that, that gets, after it's been parsed. And then the syntax tree is basically going to be translate it into a, a tree structure, a query plan tree, or, or a DAG. Right? And the idea is that at the leaf, the leaf nodes, the bottom of, of the tree structure will be the access methods we talked about, either scanning indexes, scanning the table itself. And they're going to be feeding table or sort of feeding data up uh, along its path to its, its parent node, a parent operator, to do the processing. Right? So say we're doing a, a join here on A and B. So at the access, the, the lowest level of the leaves, I'm scanning A, I'm scanning B, and the A operator is passing data up to the join, the B operator is passing up to this filter operator, which then passes up to the join. The join outputs data that then goes to the projection operator, and then the, after the projection operator, that's the result that's re returned back to the application. So I'm not going to say what the actual granularity or what, what this data actually looks like that we're passing along. Uh, we'll cover that next week. But just know that this is, this is roughly how every single database system is going to execute queries at, at a high level. So the, this is what, what, I'm, what I'm showing here was what we refer to as a logical plan, meaning like I'm not telling you how I'm accessing A, how I'm accessing B. I'm not telling you what join algorithm I'm using. I'm just saying this is the logical flow I want for my data. So what today's lecture is about and going forward is to then discussing, okay, what are the actual physical implementations of the physical operators we would have in our database system to do a join, to do a sorting, uh, to do a you know, filter, and so forth, right? So that's, that's what we're, we're, we're about going forward today. The other thing that I'm going to punt on for now is coming up with the right or the optimal configuration for this query plan. Again, SQL says, it's a declarative language, says this is the answer I want. The database system is up to figure out, has to figure out what's the most optimal way to execute this. And that could be in two ways. Be, be trying to optimize the, the, what physical algorithm you want to use. Like, is one join better than another? Spoiler is hash join is usually better, so that you would want to pick that. 
Um, but it also could be a logical restructuring of the query plan, similar to what we saw re logical reordering of the relational algebra. So for example, here, I put the filter below the join because I don't want to do a join on a bunch of data that I'm going to filter out later on. So it's called a, a, a you know, filter pushdown or, or predicate pushdown. Right? So the, both these other optimizations, we can, we can ignore it for now. Okay? And so just before, since the entire semester, we've been assuming that we're working on a, a disk-oriented database system. Not only can we not assume that the, database, the tables that we're trying to access can't fit in memory, we can't assume that the intermediate results from one operator to the next will fit entirely in memory. And that means we're going to have to use our buffer pool again to allow us to uh, implement these physical operators that can then eventually, if necessary, spill out the disk if the intermediate results of an operator doesn't, doesn't it exceeds our, our allocated memory, right? And so this, means, again, as I said before, it's be much different than maybe how you studied study algorithms before in the past where the asymptotic complexity, if you just look at you know, the number of comparisons or uh, the number of operations you have to do, may not be the right way to judge whether one algorithm is better than another. It may actually be how often do I, gotta, do I have to read and write things to disk, right? Hash tables are going to be 0, 01, that's great. But if it's random access and I'm jumping to random, random pages and I'm going doing random I.O., that's bad. And maybe I want to do something that is, uh, you know, according you know, from algorithm, of course, is, is slower, but I'm going to get more sequential I.O. out of that. Or I'll bring things in memory, do as much work as I need to do on it, and then never have to go back and look at it again. Right? So again, just like before, we're going to try to choose algorithms that are where we're conscious of how we're bringing things in and out of disk. Um, and we want to maximize the amount of sequential I.O., right? And this, is, of course, could be another good example of why we don't want the OS to manage our memory for us, because the OS doesn't know what algorithm we're actually using. It's not going to know how we can prefetch things uh, if it's not always going to be sequential. Or may not know that like, the next step of our algorithm is going to be reusing the block we just fetched in, and, and then so therefore don't swap it out, right? All right, so today we're going to start off with the, the sort of simple primitive of sorting. Um, and this sort of seems ob obvious. Why do we need to sort in a database? Right? Well, it's because the relational model. Oh, yes, question. Sorry, so uh, I think the running thing in the course is we don't want the OS to do anything for us. So I was wondering, like, how do we get to So his statement is that the running theme of the course that I've, I've laid out is that the OS is, we don't want the OS to do anything because uh, it's getting in our way. So what do we actually need an OS for? Yeah. I mean, the OS is like a frenemy, right? You, we need it because we need to boot things up, right? And like deal, deal with the, talking to the hardware in some cases. But wouldn't it be better to, instead of have like Linux or Unix, like ask the OS, just have an extreme lightweight that. I mean, they, the one guy over here brought this up and was like, should we just have a unikernel? What you're referring to is like a unikernel, where like you basically strip down the OS to not do anything but whatever we need for our database system to actually do. There was some work done in the early 80s where you basically would build a database system on like raw bare metal hardware, right? Like you wrote your own firmware to talk directly to the hardware. Nobody does that anymore because the overhead is just, it's just not worth it. Um, no, the, the answer is the, the OS, we don't want the OS to do almost anything, right? Uh, and therefore, we, there's a bunch of optimizations we've seen. Uh, we talked a little about some of these things. We can talk more about these things in the advanced class. There are methods now to get the either kernel bypass to avoid having to talk to OS for things. Like instead of having to go talk to uh, the OS's a API to access the file system, we can maybe do uh, like kernel bypass and go directly to the hardware and get the data we need to read and write. We, we want to try to do those things, yes. We want to do our own, own scheduling. We want to do our own memory allocation. We want to do everything, yes. We, we're always in a better position because we know what exactly what the, what the queries are trying to do, what our data looks like, what other queries are queued up to doing. Yes. So we need the OS, like, I don't know, like, again, it's, it's, it's frenemy is the best way I can say. You need it to exist. But, like, we don't, we, want, we don't want to talk to it. OK. All right, so, again, why do we need to sort? Uh, Again, at the very beginning of the semester, we talked about how the relational model and its SQL are inherently uh, unsorted, but oftentimes we're going to have queries that are going to want things sorted, right? Show me the top 10 you know, actors in different movies, as you guys did in homework one. 
show me the top 10 players in a game, right? So order by is a very common uh, operation we're going to see, and therefore we need to be able to, 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 to support this efficiently. There are going to be some cases, though, where even if the query doesn't say it wants, it, wants the data to be sorted, we're actually sorting things for ourselves internally as we're running the query is actually going to put us in a better position to do things more easily in the upper levels of the tree. Right? So it's going to be really easy for us to do some aggregations now, like duplicate elimination with a distinct clause, if we sort things. Because now we can just rip through the, the data after it's sorted and then know that whatever we're looking at, whatever key we're looking at at this point, if it's the same one as we saw in the, in the previous one, then we know it's a duplicate and we can just ignore it. Right? We can do this also for, uh, for aggregations with group by clauses. We saw how to do bulk loading with the B plus tree if you sort it ahead of time. So sorting is going to be uh, useful for us for a bunch of different parts of the database system. Um, and it'll make some algorithms, again, in the upper parts of the tree much more efficient if we know it's coming in sorted, which we would know because we're, the database system is the one controlling the query plan. It knows what steps it's doing as it moves data up, and therefore it's, these assumptions are valid or safe. So as I said in the beginning, we're assuming of a disk-oriented system. Uh, where the data could be, you know, out, could be out in disk, we have to spill a disk. But if everything does fit into memory, then there, we don't do anything special. Then uh, you know we can just use quick sort. That's just what Postgres does, right? Whatever, if everything fits in memory, then whatever your favorite sorting algorithm is, right? Sample sort, smooth sort, cocktail shaker sort, what, like whatever crazy thing you can find, it, you, you can do it. I mean, we don't care. That's fine. It's when it doesn't fit in memory, then this is when we need to be more careful and we, and we have to be more, uh, use a technique that's aware of the cost of, of going out to disk. As, uh, you know, again, because the data doesn't fit all in disk in the beginning, uh, or we're, as we're generating intermediate results, we have to spill those to disk as well. Okay? So everything doesn't fit in memory, quick sort is gonna be a terrible idea because you're gonna have those pivots, it's gonna, that's all gonna be random IO, and that's gonna be a nightmare. We don't wanna use quick sort. We have to be, we have to be, do something smarter. So today I'm going to talk about uh, sort of in general two quick or two, two different sorting algorithms when you have to go spell to disk. The heap sort for top end queries. This is like a, this is pretty obvious. This we'll cover this quickly. The main one is going to be the external merge sort, uh, the main technique for sort of divide and conquering, uh, do a divide and conquer approach for, uh, for being able to sort, you know, sort things that don't fit in memory. And this divide and conquer strategy is going to be useful for other parts in our database system as well, as we'll see uh, in next class and going forward. And we'll see how next week we can use sorting and also hashing for, for doing joins as well. All right? And then we'll finish up talking about how to use, uh, how to do aggregations, either with hashing or with sorting. All right, so this is a special case, um, but it does show up enough uh, that it's worth discussing. So if you have an order by clause, uh, with a limit, then the database system doesn't actually need to do uh, sort of multiple passes over the data set. It can just scan it once, find the top end things, and you're done. Right? So this, the technique that Postgres uses and other users is just a heap sort, right? And the basic idea is that I have my rich data set here. I should say also too. This, so this syntax here, I don't think I told you before. So the offset clause, when you use limits, that's actually not in the SQL standard. This fetch first, n rows, whatever. This is what shows up. This is what actually is in the SQL standard. This is what SQL Server supports and other systems support. Um, but this is basically saying, I want to, uh, after I do my order by, I want to fetch the first four rows, but I can add this little with ties thing at the end here where uh, I want to get all the elements, even if there's ties, right? So in this case here, I have my original data set, assume it's a bunch of keys, a bunch of integers like this. Um, and then I'm just going to scan along, and I maintain uh, a sorted keep, which is like a, think of it like a priority queue where you just keep track of the, the elements in sorted order. And so at the very beginning, my, my, my heap is empty. I put three in. Uh, and then for next, uh, I want four. Slide three over, put four there. Slide, slide four and three over, put six here. Uh, add two at the end. But now here I get to nine, my, my heap is full. I know I'm looking for top four, right? Because you know, the query says it. Um, so then I just slide that over, add nine. Then I get here, and I, because I have with ties, I need to support duplicates. So I, so I drop out three and put four. 
But now I get here, and I have four again. Again, with ties, I need to have, I need to store four three times because I need to tell the, the you know, the, the result of the query should say, you know, if four has been repeated, I want to know how many times it's been repeated. So in this case here, we just, just double the size of the memory uh, for the heap, and then we can add four. And then lastly, we get here with eight. Uh, we just slide it over like that, right? Again, one pass through the data. I, main I maintain the, uh, the sort of heap. Assuming the sort of heap fits in memory, th this is super easy. Uh, and, and I'm done. All right? Yes? So, so the idea is as soon as you see the limit keyword, you try to use the support, right? His statement is as soon as you see the limit keyword, you try to use the, uh, you try to use the, the sort of heap. Yes. So at that time, we don't know if the entire heap is pretty easy. We just assume it works. That's it. Right, so, so his statement is, it, at the time, at the point you're, at, at the very beginning, you don't know whether the heap is going to fit in memory. You assume, best case scenario, that it will. Yes. Um, so they, they, we'll talk about this when we talk query optimization. The, the database system is going to maintain its own internal statistics to try to predict how much data these different operators are going to spit out. They get, it's notoriously always wrong. Uh, and so in this example here, the, Basically, it's going to maintain a histogram to say how many keys do I expect or how many values I expect for a given attribute. And you try to how many elements you're going to actually see, right? Or how many what is the likelihood that you're going to have a bunch of duplicates in a different index? Right? If this is a simple example, it's simple. Yes? Her statement is, and she's correct, and we'll get to this later, is that. If the order by attribute was was uh, if the order by attribute if there, was, if there was already a B plus three index on the order by attribute, wouldn't it be faster to scan the index instead of scanning the data? Yes, we'll get to that in a second. Yes. If you put order by after the limit, does it change the semantics? He says if you put order by after the limit, does it change the semantics? Why would it? I mean, if in that case, you first fetch the first four rows and then sort them. Uh, I mean, you have, you have, you have, if you did like a nested query, because uh, I don't think I don't think I don't think the syntax will allow you to put the, the limit before the order by. Uh, if you did a nested query with a limit inside of it, and then you have the order by after it, um, I mean, in that case, you wouldn't need to do. In that case, like the limit four would just you grab the first four tuples and you're done. Mm -hmm. The order by on the outside would then just do quick quick sort on those four keys. So yeah, that would change the semantics of it. Okay, like I said, this is this is a special case. Postgres supports this. Uh, some other systems support this, right? If you know you're doing, you know, just doing this top top end thing. But it's likely more common is going to be is to sort of merge sort. And so again, this is a divide and conquer algorithm that's going to split the data into uh, separate runs, uh, and then you're going to sort these runs individually. And then in subsequent phases of the algorithm, you're going to then combine sorted runs together to make larger sorted runs until you do this, until you, you completely sort the entire, entire data set, right? Now, I would say what is going to be confusing, there's going to be two phases, the sorting phase and the merging phase, uh, and then this thing will get repeated. We're actually going to, on next class, we'll talk about uh, sort merge algorithm, which you can use the merge sort uh, sorting algorithm. And so I'll be very careful next class and say, you know, what's the sorting phase of the join versus the sorting phase of the, of the, the merge sort we're talking about here. But for now, we, we can ignore all that. All right, so the phase one is going to be I'm going to sort chunks of data that can fit in memory and then write those sorted chunks back out to disk. And then I'm going to read those sorted runs back in and then combine them into larger runs that are double the size of the previous run. All right, so let's go through this visually here. Actually, quickly forget that. The, the things we're actually sorting in all these algorithms is uh, going to be key value pairs. For simplicity going forward, I'm not going to show the value portion, but you can think of this as just like when we talked about the B plus trees, I had the keys, but I didn't always show what the, the value, the thing that they were pointing to. But one interesting concept to think about now in our, in our, in our, our operator algorithms here is whether or not we, what the actual value is going to be. And there's two choices. Uh, the first is that you contain the entire contents of the tuple uh, in the value. So I would have the key and then the, the complete copy of the tuple. 
And that means that as I'm doing the sorting and I'm copying things right out the disk, I'm making multiple you know, copies of the entire tuple you know, from one step to the next. The other approach is just store the record ID, because uh, that's going to be you know, a 32 64-bit integer that I can pass around, and that's much more cheaper. Right? So the tuple, it's either early materialization or late materialization. So again, early materialization, I have the entire uh, copy of the tuple. Now you can play a game of recognizing that what, how much of the tuple you actually need in the upper parts of the system, and only patch portions of this uh, if you're doing projections. Uh, we'll cover that next week. And then late materialization is just the, the record ID. So there's trade-offs to these, right? If I have the early materialization, then I'm copying potentially a lot of data from one step to the next, right? As I do these runs, I got to copy the tuple, bring the tuple in, and write it back out over and over again. But the advantage of that is when I actually then need to produce the result to send back to the, you know, send to the client, I don't have to go fetch the tuple again uh, out from disk. I bring it in once and try to keep it in memory as much as possible. In late materialization, you can do as much of the, the, the work you can on the, on, the, uh, on the keys with just the record ID, and only when you actually need the, the rest of the values do you go fetch the tuple. So I would say that uh, the, the record ID approach, the late materialization, this is more common in column stores, right? Because when I go fetch, a, uh, I go figure out what are the minimum columns I need, operate on all of those, just pass around the record ID, and then at some point I have, to, I have to stitch the values back together. Then and only then do I follow the record ID to go get the rest of the data, right? Because this assumes you're going to filter out more things. You're going to filter out a bunch of the, t bunch of the tuples early in the query plan, uh, and so that you don't fetch unnecessary data. Early materialization, again, has the advantage of I, I bring it in once in memory, and I never have to go back to get it. All right, so let's see how to do a two-way uh, two external number sort. So the, the number two and two-way means that it's the number of runs we're going to merge together and generate in each new run. You could have a K-way sort, meaning like, I'll, you know, I'll fetch, say I, 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 four-way would be I fetch in four runs together. And then I have four cursors walk together and merge them to a, 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 new, a new run that's four times as big as, as the previous ones. For simplicity, we'll just keep it two. And we're going to break our data up into n pages. I'm not specifying what the page size is. It doesn't matter for the algorithm. All right? But one thing we are going to have to allocate and know ahead of time is what the number of buffers that we have. So we're going to have to say we have b buffer pools, and that's, the amount of, that's a finite amount of memory that we have to bring in both the input data as we bring in runs from disk and to generate new outputs that we then write out the disk as we go from sort of one step to the next, All right? And so we talked about before how the, the database system, you can set these to be different page sizes, right? All that still applies here. In terms of the, of the buffer pool sizes, or the, the or buffers, this is usually maintained through a separate parameter you can specify uh, either in globally in the database system or in a single, for a single query or a single session or client connection, right? So like in Postgres, I think it's called like work memory. In MySQL, it's called like sort memory. So it's a parameter to say how many megabytes or how many kilobytes you're allowed to use for sorting in memory. And then when you exceed that, when, you, when, when the query exceeds that, it has to then spill out the disk, right? And how to set that correctly, you know, that, that, that's a whole other black magic that we, we can talk about later. All right, so let's walk through a simple example. So we have a our database on disk. Uh, we just have two pages, and then we have some space in memory. So in pass zero, what we're going to do is going to read all B pages from the table into memory, and then sort them into runs uh, of size of, of the original page size, uh, and then write them back back out the disk. So assume we can only bring in uh, uh, one page of memory at a time. So we're going to need actually one page for uh, the input page, and then one page for the output buffer that we're going to then write out. So in this case here, I'm going to bring in this page, and then I'm going to sort it, and then write, write it back out to disk. So because assuming these pages are coming from the, uh, you know, from, from the actual table itself, right? these are like the, 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 the primary storage table or pages of the table, I don't want to do in place, uh, I don't want to overwrite the original data. Right? I want to, these are like temporary buffers where if I crash and, and I come back, who cares that they, they get lost? right? So you could do in-place sorting once it's in memory. Uh, actually, you, you wouldn't do that for the if it comes from the, the table pages, 
because you don't, if another query has to access the data too, you, you don't want to like, if, you, if you're reorganizing it, uh, that might screw up an, another query that's running at the same time. So in the, the first pass, you always make a copy and then sort that. All right. Then now the next phase, I got to bring in the other page, bring that into memory, sort it, uh, and then I write it back out. Then now in the next pass, I'm going to bring in uh, two, the two pages uh, together, and I'm going to walk through them and sort of have a cursor on each side and do a comparison of the first element of the first page, the first element of the second page. And assuming you're going in ascending order, whichever one is, is less based on the comparison operator, the comparison function, that's the first element that goes into the, the new output buffer. Right? So I bring these two guys in, they've already sorted, and I walk through them incrementally and get all the elements that are that until I fill up my output buffer and write that out, go back and now do fill up the next another output buffer and write that out. And now we have our, our sorted data. So this, this is a high level overview. I'm just showing colors. It's not really, uh, the, the next slide will show actual values. But everyone sort of understand the, the basic idea. You bring a page in, you sort it, um, you, and then you try to then combine it with another sorted page and you walk through them incrementally and do the merge and then write out a new, a new run that's twice the size of the, the, the original pages. Yes? We have, we, have, we have three buffers, three yeah. blocks. But don't you only have two buffers? Isn't that why it costs you way to assume that it's not? Uh, no, two, the two and two A means like I'm going to sort two sorted runs together at the same time. Why can't, sorry, I'm a little bit confused. For, maybe this is the wrong question to ask, but why, why can't we just take the first page and the second? If we have three buffers, why can't we just take the first page and the second page and start, start in, the first, the first, in the first go? Oh, why can't, you're basically asking why can't I go like, why can't I just bring both in memory and sort, then sort them right now? Because you did that at the last one. Right? I mean, this is this is like just this is a toy example. Okay. I'm just, just trying to show you the, the process. It's two pages. You're right. Yes, this will fit memory. Oh, but because you're trying to do more than two pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Again, the two doesn't mean two pages. The two means I'm gonna I'm gonna merge two two runs together. All right. Let's go to the next slide and then hopefully this will make more sense. Okay. All right. Let's see a bigger example. So again, here I'm not showing the value portion of the key of, of, of the key value pairs. These are just just keys. Now we're going to have also too at the end of the uh, of the keys is uh, some end of file marker. So in this this example here, in every on one page, I'm going to have two keys. So in the first page, I have uh, it's the values or keys three and four. The next page is six and two, right? So the comma just means a separation between the keys, not not key value pairs. So in the first pass, what we're going to do is going to bring every page uh, in, in memory one by one, and then we're going to sort them based on the contents of the page, right? And then we're going to write them back out. And so in this case, I'm going to need uh, B minus one buffers because, uh, well, in, in, in the first pass, you just bring one page in, sort it, and then write it back out. But we can worry about buffers in a second. So then now, in the next phase, what I'm going to do is combine two adjacent uh, two-page sort of runs, bring, bring them into memory, uh, and then I'm going to walk through them with that cursor and compare the first key for the first page, and the, 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 the first run, and the first key of the second run, and then which, whatever one is less, that gets, gets written out to our output buffer. Right? So we start the, the, these two pages up here, two runs up here. The, we do a comparison between three and two. 2 is less than 3, so 2 gets written out. 3, and then the cursor moves over, and now we compare uh, 3 and 6. 3 is less than 6, so 3 gets written out. And now we filled up our, our page, because we can only hold two elements, and then that gets flushed to disk. And then we can continue to do the other comparisons. between. Now we're going to do uh, 4 and 6. 4 is less than 6, so 4 gets written out first in the page, and then by 6, and then this gets written out. Right? Yes? Yes, the statement is, it's, is over time, we're going to have many uh, physical pages that make up one sort of run, yes. So there's, there's additional like, bookkeeping data structure. We keep track of, like, at, I'm at this phase, uh, and for sort of run one, here's the pages that have in, in that order, yes. I'm not showing that, that data structure here. And that's in memory. That doesn't need to get spilled to disk because that's not going to be huge. Because if I crash, then who cares if the query interview results were lost? Yes. So if I don't have space to hold two pages, but I can't really 
So, so his statement is, if I don't have space to hold two pages, how do I handle this? Uh, so I'm not showing when things get written out. So when this, when this buffer gets full, it gets flushed out, and, then I, and, I, and I reuse the memory. So then now I can fill, oh, fill up another page. So I always need at least three pages in a two-way merge sort, because I need, need uh, two pages for, for the inputs for the two sort of runs, and then one page for the, uh, for, for the output. Yeah, so you need b minus one buffer pages, b minus minus one buffers or pages, for all the runs you're trying to merge together in, in the sort of merge, like and for the n ways, the k way sort. So, but okay, but like if you have to eight pages and then the last step you're doing has two sorts of data, but then why can't you get then you already have to merge all the data into one page at one go? In my example here. Yeah. In the no, we do we can we can so let's keep going. We we can do this incrementally, right? Because 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 the 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 sort of runs are sorted. The cursor never has to backtrack, meaning like if I do a comparison and, and this one is less than this one, so therefore I write this one out to my output buffer and I move this cursor down, I never have to go back and look at previous pages because I'm no, I always know I'm go going in that order. Yes. So her question is: Is the sorting happening in place? Yeah, I mean, once you're past, uh, once you're past pass one, then yes, it's in place. Well, no, no, so, so, so. I take that back. No, because because you're always writing to to an output buffer, right? So, could you swap? I mean, if it's two way, yes. Uh, if it's n way, that's more complicated. Or k way is more complicated. For simplicity, you just assume there's there's an output buffer you always write into. Uh, what is the same page? Sorry. Like the same page output that initially had before. Like so, I have this page here, this page here. I'm trying to merge them. I write into this one. I flush this out the disk, and I overwrite these guys, or what? Or overwrite them on disk? Yeah. You, you mean overwrite them on disk, or overwrite them in memory? Overwrite them on disk. You could, yeah. You could reclaim space that way, yeah. It doesn't matter. So your question is. The yeah, statement is, in, in this example here, no matter uh, how large the sort of runs are, I only need to have three pages in my buffer pool to do this. Yes. And obviously, again, in a real system, you'd have way more memory than three pages. But for simplicity and making it fit on slides, three. All right, so now we get to the next phase, uh, next pass. Uh, now we're going to generate uh, four page sort of runs. So same thing, I'm going to start with guys here and these guys here combine them together so i only need to bring in the first page for this one first page for this one do the comparison so uh two is less than four two gets written out three is less than four this page can then be flushed to death and then i have another i zero it out and then i, I keep my comparison going down. and then you keep going to the bottom until we eventually reach a uh completely sorted uh completely sorted output all right so the number of passes we have to do is going to be 1 plus the ceiling of log 2n. So the, the first, the 1, because in the first pass, we always have to do, or sorry, we always have to go past 0 to go read everything in and sort the, sort the individual pages. And then it's the ceiling of log 2n, where n is the number of uh, pages, because as we go from one pass to the next, we're generating, uh, it's exponenti exponentially, uh, we're generating exponentially larger run, run sizes, and therefore it, at some point we'll reach the entire in the entire data set has been sorted. So the total I.O. cost is going to be 2n times the number of passes. So the, the, the 2n here is because I always have to read it in and then write it back out. Right? And then it's just a number, number of passes here. So every pass is always, is always one input, one output. All right? All right, cool. Um, as I said, my example here, uh, I'm assuming we have we're, uh, three buffer pools uh, or buffer pages, one for the uh, input on the right, one for the input on the left, and then one output, right? But obviously in a real system, we'll have way more space, um, and we don't want to ever have to wait for I.O., 
So we want to do things asynchronously. Like I don't want to have, you know, when I fill out my output buffer and I have to write out the disk, I don't want to block my, my, my sorting algorithm while I wait that to get written. Right? So you would actually have, you know, another set of, of memory of, of pages that you can start filling up with some other thread or some other process writes out, writes out the data in the background. Right? right? So this is called double buffering. Right? The basic idea is that you can prefetch and asynchronously write things out. In the background, while I'm doing whatever it is, uh, the whatever processing I want on the on the data that I have in memory. So in my example here, I bring in page one, uh, and I start sorting that. Um, and in the background, I'm going to bring in page uh, the other page, so that when I finish the sorting of the first page, uh, the second page is ready to go, and I can just sort that. All right? That's that's pretty obvious. So uh, in general, the general external more sort is uh, Works exactly the same thing, the same way, but now we just include B as, as, a, as a constant to determine how many pages we're actually going to need. Uh, so again, in pass zero, we're always going to use all the, the, the buffer pool pages, right? Because we're not doing any comparisons between sorted runs. It's always sorting the, the single page by itself and writing it out. Um, and so now we're going to generate the ceiling of N over B uh, sorted runs of size B. And in the subsequent passes, we're always going to have B minus one uh, runs. Right, because it's we always need for we always need at least we always need exactly one output buffer to write things out. All right, so the math uh, works out like this. It's basically plug and chug. Uh, so, for example, here we're going to say we have a uh, a data set with 108 pages with five buffer pages to sort. So we say n equals 108, b equals b equals five. So again, first pass, we take n divided by b, take the ceiling of that. And that means we're going to generate 22 different sorted runs, each of, of, of page, uh, page size 5. But the last one is going to have the th uh, it just have three pages. Again, that's why we take the ceiling. Yes? In the BA external merge sort example, could there have been ones that lost in, in my queue? So state, uh, this question is for this one here. Is saying it should be 1 plus log 2 and what? And minus three or divided by three? Divide. divide. Why divide by three? Uh. So, I see. So you don't. So it, it, I mean, so you don't need. Uh, how do I say this? The log size. Sorry, the, the size of, of the the run is is doubling, right? So it's it, the the B factor is really the B factor determines how many pages you're bringing in. So it's log two means I'm bringing in. I can bring in two sets of sorted runs at a time. Right? I'm ignoring that the the three, the extra buffer is for the output. I ignore that. So that, that's why you don't you don't count for B in this. Yes. For the general formula, could you bring it up again? So where does the n over b the b score come from? Because that's the number of uh it's the number of um, it's, it's the number of pages I have, and then how many chunks can I put them in? I take the ceiling of that because there may be ones at the end that don't fill all the all the the entire run, but I have to account for it anyway, right? And, and then the Yeah, yes. Yes, we can take this online. Yeah, I think that's the issue is that the, this has arbitrary size buffer or, or runs uh, based on B. And then the, in the, in the, the original one, it's only the run size is just one for simplicity. We can take this offline and I'll double check the math. Uh, but I'm fairly certain that this works out. But we, we can cover up uh, any confusion on Piazza afterwards. Okay? Okay. Um, right. So as I said, like the 
it's pretty much plug and chug, right? Uh, you're just getting larger and larger run sizes as you go down. And at the end, you end up with a sort of run file of size 108. And then in this example here, the math works out that we end up with, with four passes like this, right? Again, this is, this is, uh, it's math. There's, there's, there's nothing really special about it. But again, the general idea is that we're dividing up the, the, the data set into smaller chunks. We can sort them uh, and then write them out. And then now when we bring in the, the, uh, the sorted runs, we don't have to backtrack in our, uh, as we do our scans and do our comparisons. And that way we're, we're maximizing, maximizing the amount of sequential I.O. we have to do and, and reducing, removing any wasted I.O. Okay, two quick optimizations that I want to talk about that beyond just the, the sorting algorithm itself, right, is how you actually want to do the comparisons uh, in your data set. So this, this, these, this will matter if whether or not we're doing certain merge sort, the heap sort, or the, or the in-memory quick sort. So the first issue is going to be the, the cost of actually the comparison itself. Right? It's, it's always going to be the cost of the comparison, but the first issue is the cost of invoking the comparison function. So if you ever used uh, like the standard template library, uh, you have to pass in maybe like a, a pointer to a function to do, to do your sort. You can do a lambda function in some cases, and that'll get compiled in. Um, but do you think of like a, uh, a system like Postgres and MySQL or, or for really any sort of general purpose database system, they need to be able to do a comparison on any possible key types or any possible combination of keys. So typically the way the sorting algorithms are implemented is that there'll be you pass in the function pointer that says, I know how to compare whatever the key, the key type it is that I'm doing my sorting algorithm. So if everything fits in memory, uh, if you're trying to do this as fast as possible, the cost of actually that, that, that following that, that pointer to, to the function and do that comparison can actually be quite expensive, especially, again, if, if it's in memory doing quick sort. So we're not going to talk about code specialization and, and just-in-time compilation in this, in this semester other than this point here. but. In some systems, you can actually build out the, a specialized version of the sorting algorithm where the, the comparison function is actually hard-coded in the sorting algorithm implementation itself so that if you know you're comparing like two 32-bit 32 32 integer keys, you don't have to follow that function pointer. You have it baked in exactly to, to the, the sorting algorithm that how to do that comparison. And that's really fast. Right? So, so Postgres does this. Uh, it's kind, of, it's kind of a hack. Uh, they, ha they, ha they have some Perl script that basically takes the sorting algorithm and then duplicates it and makes a, you know, an integer version of the comparison built, built in, makes a floating point one built in. Right? So they have duplicate code in, in the system to do quick sort for the different key types you can do comparisons on. Another technique that's similar to the compression stuff that we talked about before is to do suffix truncation. Where if I'm gonna, if I have to compare varchars that could be arbitrary length, doing string comparisons is actually really slow, right? So a better approach would be to first do the sorting on prefixes of, of the strings, and I, ideally a binary representation of them. So now you're just comparing integers, and I can still have the order, I still preserve the order ordering of the strings with my binary representation, but now I'm comparing like two 32-bit integers rather than arbitrary length strings. And so it's, if, if the, the binary representations or the prefixes are, st if they're distinct, then my sorting algorithm will still work when I do that comparison, and that's really fast. If the prefixes are equal, then I have to go then follow the, follow, follow the pointer to go get the original, original value, then I do the more expensive one. And that's sort of like the optimistic stuff we talked about in, in the last class, where I assume the comma case keys are not going to be equal, and therefore, this truncation approach speeds things up. Yes? So your question here, that the string order is the same as the binary order? The statement is, do I assume that the, that the, the string order matches the binary order? It has to, yes. Uh, actually, uh, what is the binary process in fact? That's after the first three integer or long? Uh, I mean, so like, that? think of like string. What's that? Sorry, just like the first three bits of that. Yeah, just like, there's, I'll, I'll send you a link to the Postgres one. There's, so you won't compare the length. Of the what's that? No, you won't compare the length. You don't need, again, again, like, I, 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 don't, I don't need to, right? Okay. Yeah. If, if, if my name is AAA, your name is XXX, then, like, the binary prefix, like, sorry, AA, like, if my name is, like, the, the character A 128 times, your name is the character X 128 times, I can just look at the first few bits and know that mine, mine is less than yours. 
and therefore I don't need to do the full string comparison. Yes? Which relies on ASCII being sorted, more or less. It, it's even as it relies on ASCII being sorted. So we're not talking about collations. You, the data system can't always assume that it's dealing with ASCII data. Right. Uh, there, there's different collations, different languages, like there's different ordering for characters. Then, then, then there's Unicode. Uh, you have to, you have to, handle, you have to know, you have to be aware of that. And know that. Um, there was this bug in Postgres. I don't know if I talked about this. There was a bug in Postgres a few years ago where um, they relied on, uh, I think libc, like the 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 built-in like libc comparison operator for strings, um, and then a new version of libc came out where the string ordering for Unicode switched. So now, like, it, if, since they rely on it, whatever the, the whatever libc said is the ordering, uh, when they first built the B plus tree, they, they built a B plus tree on, on, a, on, a, on a varchar column. Before, the, before the, the upgrade of libc, it would be sorted one way, and then after the upgrade, it would be sorted another way, and it broke all these people's B plus trees. Uh, so collations are super tricky to deal with. All the enterprise systems implement that some stuff themselves. Postgres, and I think MySQL rely on like the open source ones. Yes. So since you mentioned that we can compare to like the uh, if we have this type of OSP uh like a page and this type of OSP system, essentially it's Yeah, so 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 his his question is uh if I don't have a index going back to the very beginning. If I don't have an index on a table, uh then the, these like leaf nodes in the, in the query plan, these always have to be a sequential scan. Yes, the fallback option is always going to be sequential scan, and that some cases that's okay. For sometimes it's it's a, it's a bad idea. Like you want to have an index. And does modern database like do, that, do they automatically generate those indices, or is it still So his, his question is, and we take this one offline. Uh, do do modern database systems automatically build indexes? Some yes, most do not. Postgres does not. That's my startup. <laughs> it's hard. It's, it's like it's MB complete problems. It's, it's not easy to do. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to bring up the, the example she brought up in the beginning, where if I already have a order preserving data structure or index on my the keys I want to sort, like a B plus tree we spent the uh, you know the last two classes talking about, then the data sets could recognize. Aha! You want to sort by on the thing I already have an index on. It may be actually better for me just to, to traverse the, the B plus tree than scan a load on leaf nodes because I'll get my data sorted that way, right? So we have to think of two cases. There's the cluster indexes and uncluster indexes. Um, for cluster indexes, this is always going to be a good, good idea. Again, you have to make sure that the, the well, ideally, the, the, whatever you have in your order by clause is exactly what's in the, is what the index is based on. You can, in some cases, be, uh, you know, if you only have a, uh, you know, the prefix of, of, the, of the index keys and not the full thing in your order by clause, then you can still use it. Postgres, I think, is very, uh, very conservative. And if it doesn't have an exact match of the, the keys, then, then it doesn't use the index. Um, but the, the commercial guys are, are a bit more aggressive on reusing indexes. Right, so if it's, a, if it's a clustered index, then this is the best case scenario because we just tra whatever traverse the the leaf nodes. We get all our, uh, we get we get all the entries we need, uh, and we just scan along a sequential access. In this case here, you actually could just traverse the index once and scan along scan along the pages, uh, and just know when you, when you need to stop. You wouldn't actually have to maybe scan the the, the, the tree itself. For on cluster index, again, the this could be tough because if everything's in different sort of order, uh, and, the, and the tuple pages versus what's in the leaf nodes then this could be a you know, random I.O. For, for each one. So the data system is going to try to be clever and figure out uh, how much the index is going to help it versus just scanning what you need, everything, and then uh, sequentially, and then doing the sorting. Right? And this is what I was saying before, that the, the, the optimizer is going to try to figure out when it converts a, a SQL query into an actual physical plan it wants to execute, it has to make an estimations about uh, how much I.O. it's going to do from one sort of strategy versus a, another. Okay, but before we jump into aggregations, any questions about sorting? Right, the, 
everything's in memory, quick sort. If it's a top end, we can use heap sort. Uh, if, it, if we think it's going to spill to disk, then we, we would use external merge sort. Now, some you could have a strategy where I assume best case scenario, and I'm always going to start off with a quick sort. And then if I get it wrong, throw the results away and fall back to a merge sort. Uh, that's called adaptive query processing. Very few systems do that because it's, it's hard to do. Right? You basically have to have checks as you run the query. Say, oh, my, my estimations are right. My, uh, my assumptions are wrong. Kill myself and start back over. Again, the enterprise guys can do, do some of these things. The, the open source ones cannot. All right, so let's talk about how, how we actually want to implement out, uh, aggregations now. Right, so just recall from the beginning of the semester that an aggregation is some kind of function that we're going to take multiple uh, values from a single attribute in, in, a, in our data set and then convert it into a single scalar value. Min, max, sum, count, average, so forth. All right? So when we actually want to implement these aggregations, we need a way for the system to quickly find the tuples that have the same values for the attribute that we're trying to build the aggregation on so that we can group them and compute whatever it is, whatever the aggregation function we, we want. So there's going to be two basic, there's basically only two ways you can implement aggregations. It's either going to be through sorting or hashing, because the, the dumbest thing you could do is just scan through the table over and over and over again, right? And that you could compute your aggregation that way, but that would, that would be dumb. You don't want to do that, right? So we're basically going to rely on the sorting stuff we talked about before, and then we'll see how we can use some elements of the hash table stuff we talked about to do aggregations with, with, uh, with hashes, hash tables. And so the, again, as I said before, the spoiler is almost always is hashing. The hashing approach is almost always going to be better uh, than sorting, uh, especially if your disk is slow. Right? And the idea what we're trying to do here is we're trying to avoid having random I.O. Uh, on going to disk and maximize the amount of sequential access that we can actually do. So both of these techniques are going to try, try to achieve that. So let's start with the most simple uh, aggregation you could have with the distinct. Right, you're just trying to find what are all the unique uh, course IDs from the enroll table. Right? So I'm not showing the query, what the query tree looks like, but you can assume that we have to scan the enroll table. We're going to apply some filter for, that we have in our where clause to find all the, the, the grades that are, either B, that are either B and C. And then we actually can do a uh, projection early on as well, because uh, we're assuming we're doing early materialization. So we don't have to copy a bunch of the columns for our tuples as we go along. So we'll push down the, the projection, remove everything but the course ID, because that's the only thing we actually need to produce result. And then we're going to sort, sort, sort this single column. Right? And then now to produce the final result, we just scan through the, the output of, of, the, of the sorting and just keep track of what was the last value I looked at, at, at in my cursor. And then if I ever come across the same value as the one I previously looked at, I know it's a duplicate, and I can, I can throw it away. All right? Pretty straightforward, pr pretty simple. So this, this idea of throwing away d data as quickly as possible, that's a recurring theme about query optimization. That's the whole point of query optimization. Uh, so I showed how to push down the filter. I showed how to push down the projection. And again, this is something the data system will figure out for you it, 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 with SQL. You don't have to write this stuff yourself. So my example here, I had an order by clause. So it made sense to implement the distinct aggregation using sorting because the the aggregate was based on it was on the course ID. There was an order by clause on the course ID. So I kill two birds with one stone. I could do the sorting, get things in the sort of order, and do quick duplicate elim elimination. All right? But if my data doesn't need to be sorted, then maybe that's not the, the best approach for me. Right? I could have uh, but I but I still could use sorting because I just look at the previous one and find the things I'm looking for, right? But there may be cases where, uh, as I said, where hashing actually can be better because if I only need to remove duplicates, I don't need to do any, any sorting, then it's more efficient just to build the hash table or build some intermediate data structure than having to sort everything and then walk through it again, right? Because I can start throwing things away uh, as I'm doing the hashing when I identify that I have, I have duplicates, right? But of course, now, as I said, if it's, if it's, if it's going to be random I.O., like if my hash table or whatever I'm trying to build doesn't fit in memory, then I don't want to have to start swapping pages in and out and, and thrashing on disk because 
I, you know, the thing I needed before was it got flushed out the disk or written out the disk, and then now I need it again. I got to go read it again, right? So we don't want to pay for the same real estate twice. We want to when we bring something in, into memory from disk, we want to do all the processing we can on it, and then throw it away and never have to go back and get it again, right? So let's see how we can do this with, with a hashing aggregate. So what we're going to do is going to populate an ephemeral hash table uh, as the, as the data system scans the table. And then for the each record that we find, we're going to see whether there's already an entry in this hash table. Uh, if yes, and, and if there is, and, and it's a it's like a distinct clause that we can throw it away. If it's a group by, then we can do whatever the computation that we want for the aggregate function uh, incrementally to sort of maintain a running running total of these things. And then once we reach the end, then then we, we can we can produce the final result. Maybe do some additional calculations, additional computations. To get the correct answer that they're looking for. So if everything's in memory, this is easy to do, right? The trick, of course, the tricky is when we have to spell it to disk. So again, the, the hashing stuff, if we just go with the hashing tables we talked about before, that's going to be a bunch of random access and that's going to kill us, right? So by being smarter, we want to maximize the amount of work we have to do on a page whenever we, we bring it into memory. So an external hashing function is going to look kind of like the external merge sort where there was multiple phases. Uh, and for this purposes here, for this, this class, we'll assume that we only need to run through these two phases uh, once. Right? External merge sort, you may have the multiple passes, write things out, bring it back in. We assume in this case here that we can run both phases uh, once and then we're done. We'll see next class how we handle things that don't, that we may have to go multiple passes. All right, so the first phase, we're going to partition the data into buckets based on whatever the hash key is. And then whenever our bucket gets full, we just write it out to disk, reuse the memory, and then keep filling it up. All right, so once we do that first pass on the data, we, then we go into the second phase. And now we're going to bring in uh, those buckets one at a time. Uh, and then we're going to build a, uh, a memory hash table for each partition to then compute whatever the aggregation is that we want to, to generate for the query. All right? Again, the idea here is we're trying to maximize sequential I.O. All right, so in phase one, we're going to use, we're use a hash function H, and we're going to split the tuples into tuples, or sorry, split the tuples into partitions. And a partition is basically going to be a sort of logical grouping of one or more pages that we know that they're going to contain the keys of the same values. And then when the key, when, the, when these sort of buckets full, we write them out to output buffers. We maintain an internal memory uh, data structure to keep track of, you know, these, the, for this partition, the buckets are located here on disk. And for this purpose here, we can assume that we have B, B buffers, uh, and then we're always going to use uh, B minus one buffers for the output, uh, and then one buffer for the input. All right. All right. So let's see an example here now. I will say I'm showing the, showing the uh, an aggregation back on the distinct again. There is there's an obvious optimization as I'm going along where you can actually just recognize that you have duplicates uh, as you're running out the buckets. But let, let's ignore that for now, right? But this is the same code we had before, but without the order by clause. So I do my filter, I do remove the columns, and then now I'm going to scan through the output of, of of the after the projection, and I'm going to apply the hash function. And I modify the number of partitions that I have, and that's going to tell me which, which sort of sequence of buckets I go to, or which bucket I'm going to go to, right? And so in this case here, say I, I, there's a bunch of people taking 445, 645, and so all those, those and then keep filling it up. So I'm not, it's not like, this is not actually a hash table where I'm actually trying to you know, scan through and try to find, do I have duplicates? For simplicity reasons, I'm just saying, I just keep it to the end of the page, and then we'll just write it out. And the question is, if I see the same key, then I, I, just, I can just ignore it and throw it away. Yes? When you say hash table, wouldn't that be like, wouldn't that be complex? Yeah, so his statement is, if you're using a hash table, wouldn't it be complex? So what I'm saying, yeah, so I'm saying this is not a hash table that does complex. This is literally, I take whatever this, this value is, I hash it, mod by the number of partitions I have, and then that tells me what page I'm going to write to, and I just append to the end of the page until it's full. I don't look at what's in the page. But don't you have to, but isn't your purpose to find this thing? That's why we're hashing. Because we want... Yeah, so... so, so 
the question is like, yeah, we're trying to find distinct in this example here. Isn't that why, isn't that why we're hashing? Yeah. I, at this phase, I'm trying to divide things up, divide the data set into smaller chunks, into partitions, so then I can go back and then we we'll do whatever aggregation of function I want to do on. The, I should fix this at table. The confusing part is, of course, that like, at this point here, as I'm hashing into it, I could just look and say, do I already see this key from before? If yes, then don't put it in, right? right. But so, go ahead, this. So you're just hashing a different way to divide it out from the key. Yes, the statement is, is we're using the hash function as a way to divide things up. Yes. Then you can get the question of, like, oh, what about skew? If everything hashes the same thing, uh, uh, ignore that. All the same challenges we talked about with hash tables. Yes? You do have to have the special data structure to keep track of, like, if you write a fake secret and then you start another one, you have to keep track of those fake IDs, right? Yeah, so his statement is, um, and he's correct, like, you have to keep track in memory uh, where the page IDs or the, the list of page IDs that correspond to a, a partition. Yeah, so when you write out the disk, the next is you know what you need to bring. And I would imagine, like, we also have to make sure that if the system crash, we know we'll have to use this memory to like, just keep that kind of data structure. So his statement is, and he, he's correct again, that, like, if I crash while I'm doing this, I don't want to come back and have these pages look to be occupied and then not be able to reuse them, right? Yeah, so. You'd store this temporary data as sort of separate files than actually the, the table heap, right? It's like, because it's scratch data. If I crash and I lose it, who cares, right? When we talk about distributed system, distributed databases, there, th that is a divine, des design philosophy in, in most databases, distributed databases would be if a machine goes down while I'm computing a query, then the query just fails. I don't care about trying to recover things. That has slightly changed in, in, in newer systems, but. For our purposes here, if we crash while the query is running, we don't try to pick up when we start back up. We just say, because if, if you wanted the result, if you, if you really wanted that query, then just it's up to you to submit it again. OK, so again, this is not a hash table. We're just filling up buckets uh, of, uh, within our partitions. And we, we ignore the, the duplicate elimination at this point. All right, so now in the second phase, what we're going to do is we're going to rehash everything all over again and now build an in-memory hash table. So for each partition on disk, we look at our internal data structure and say, here's all the pages we have for that partition. We're going to read them, bring them to memory one by one, and we're going to scan through them, use another hash function to build out a new hash table to then do it whatever the, the aggregation function that, that we want it to be. right? And then now that we bring things back into memory in this second phase, we never have to go back and look at other pages we've already brought back in. Right, as we scan through sequentially, we do whatever, you know, do our hash, put it in the hash table, or do whatever you want to do, and then we never have to go back and look at, look at anything else. All right? And again, for, for simplicity, we assume that the, the hash table fit in memory, assume that the partitions can, can, can fit in memory. Uh, if you have to spell a disk, then it, you, you can deal with it, but it's, it's, it's not as bad as building the hash table on the entire data set. Again, the hash table is going to get smaller, so it should be able to fit. So we go back here. Here's our phase one buckets. Uh, and we're going to bring in B, B minus one partitions. And we go bring in the first page, just scan through it sequentially, use another hash function, uh, and build out the hash table to do whatever it is we want to do. So here's the two classes uh, that people have taken, 445 and 826. I don't think we've offered 826 in a while. Uh, but right. And then now, once we complete the scanning through all these the, the, the pages with the sort of first partition, then we can then append the result to, uh, to the, the sort of the final output buffer that we're maintaining as the final result for this query. And then now I go skip down to the next the next pages, the next partition, bring those in memory one by one, build a new hash table, and same thing. Use a second hash function, build this out, and at some point when I'm finished scanning all the all the pages from the bucket or the partition, I then append the result to to the final output buffer, and then I'm done. Again, the key idea here is because we've already, in the first phase, we've already hashed the keys uh, and then split them up into these different. I know as I'm scanning down to this sort of second partition here, there's not going to be 721 up over here. Right? So I can throw away the first hash table because I know that the hash function, since it's deterministic, is not going to incorrectly, uh, I'm not going to incorrectly find a 721 up here. Uh, you know, it can only be in this partition down here. 
Yes. Wait, like, why can't, since we have already passed the prototype based on either V5 keyword and stuff like that, why do we need to rehash it, put it into another hash group? Can we just run a running average at some point? Like, bring them, uh, bring like 15, 445 into memory, like, everything into that average at some point, and then just be done. I mean, your statement is why even why even build this second hash table here, yeah. and why just like keep, keep do what keep track of what? Like why why not like say if like the average assumption is like count, we don't have to have these two or the hash table. We can just count in the bucket and then. Yeah. So to his, to his statement, he's correct. In some cases, for for some uh, well, in this example here. Um, So, I mean, because in my example here, like, it's there's only one value. It's 445. So you just rip through this account, the number of entries. But because I could have uh, collisions where different keys hash to the same partition, I have to maintain some data structure to keep that running count of them. Oh, because you, you, you might have collisions. Yeah, my, my simple example here, there's only one value. So it's, it's trivial, but think of, like, a larger data sets. So he says, best case scenario where we collide or have, uh, have a collision in both H1, H2, we have this is a real hash table now. So we can handle conflicts. We can handle you know, linear, linear probe hashing. Yes? I don't want to miss something, but why do you have two hash tables? So this is just trying to divide. The, the first one, it's not a hash table. It's just. Oh, it's not this part, but when you were on oh. phase two. Because. See, and then, and then I throw this away, and then I build a new one because I don't want to assume that I can have a giant hash table fit everything into memory, yeah. right? So I, by dividing it up, I could build another hash table, and the whole idea is that this now can be smaller. Uh, the second hash table can be smaller, and I and I and I'm not going to worry about missing, have any false uh, false negatives because I missed something in the first partition because I it would have been hashed into it the first the first case the, the first phase. All right, so now let's talk about the example he was asking of like, okay, distinct is sort of obvious. There's optimizations we can do that for that. But let's look at the other the other type of aggregations that are more common. Or not more common, but like other aggregations you want to do. So when we do the rehash phase, uh, instead of just storing the hash table that say does the key exist, we actually want to store the, 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 the whatever the running value it is that we're trying to compute for our aggregation function, right? So when we want to insert a new entry into this in memory hash table at the second phase, if the key doesn't exist, then we populate a new entry. Uh, but if it does exist, then we basically do like an upsert where we update the running total, whatever they're trying to compute for the aggregate function, for you know, based on whatever the algorithm that we need to do. Right? And we can do this for if we have multiple aggregation functions in our in, in our in our query, right? So going back here now, so now we have a new query. We, we want to get the average GPA. Um, so say we've already done first phase where we split everything up into buckets. And now we're going to do, do hash on our second function and build this hash table. But now the, the value portion is going to be, uh, in the case of an average, it's going to be the count and then uh, a, a running summation, right? Uh, for min, max, and sum and count, it's sort of obvious that counts as plus one, sum is just adding to the total, right? So we're computing this incrementally as we're scanning through in the second phase, hashing to the hash table. And then when, we, when, we, when we're done doing the scan of all the buckets, uh, it, depending on what the aggregation function is, we could just be done and this hash table is the final result. Or we have to take a second pass and in case of average and then you know, divide the, the sum by the count to produce whatever the, the average should be. Right? Pretty straightforward, right? All right, cool. All right, so that's it. Uh, so the choice of sorting and hashing is usually easy. It's usually hashing is always going to be the better one to do. And, and if you try out your favorite database system, if they support both techniques, you'll see oftentimes they'll pick uh, hashing over, over sorting. Um, and then if you're going to build a new database system from scratch, you probably want to build a, well, if you need to support order by, then you build sorting first. Uh, 
and then maybe you, you can leverage that to do some some of the aggregations and then you if you have time then you go build the hashing stuff second right we've seen a bunch of optimizations how we already how we do uh, sorting right we're chunking io or chunking trying to amortize the cost of going fetching things from disk by grouping them together and, and then maximizing amount of sequential scans and then we can do double buffering to have to not block a, the, a thread uh, one has to go get IO, let somebody else go get that, uh, and then you, then you keep processing. Yes? So right now we are all assuming that we have a single uh, database server that holds all the things. So we are not considering any disaggregated stuff, right? So the, we are considering like a single database server with some amount of the memory. Yeah, so the statement is, for this point in the semester, we're assuming we have our database system is running on a single machine, single server, okay. uh, without multiple machines. Yes? So he says, if you have enough memory to, to sort, sort uh, your, data, your server has enough memory, let's keep it to a single server. Because let's, let's ignore the network. Yeah. If I have enough memory on a single server, then I avoid all of these problems. Uh, so yes and no. So there are, uh, there are database systems called in-memory in -memory databases or main memory databases where the architecture is written such that it assumes that all the data fits in memory, including both the tables and in results and indexes. And in that case, you get rid of the buffer pool, you get rid, rid of a bunch of stuff, right? And it runs a lot faster. Uh, so that's, that's what my, my PhD thesis was on, was in-memory databases. Um, I really thought they were going to take off and be the way everyone would build systems going forward because uh, you know, memory was getting cheaper and larger. But Flash got a lot cheaper and a lot faster. Uh, so that market really kind of didn't take off, and I was wrong. Um, there are some optimizations, yes, that you can do when, when you know when you think everything's going to fit in memory. Then you just quick sort for everything. Uh, you still want to still want to use D plus trees. You don't have to worry about like, page latches and like latching on pages and things like that. Yes, there, you can optimize the system designed specifically for uh, for in memory execution. If you take Postgres and MySQL, though, again they are built from the ground up, assuming things don't fit in memory. So even if you give it a large buffer pool size, it's still going to do all the things that we talked about here. Just the query optimizer would recognize, OK, the, I set my sort buffer to be super, super large. So therefore, for this particular query, I don't have to build a disk. I don't need to use external merge sort. I'll use quick sort. But you still have to go to do the page table lookup stuff, right? That was sort of a long, long winded answer to say, like, you, you, there's optimizations you can do if you, fit, if you assume everything fits in memory. Most system, like, these disk-oriented systems don't do that for, for many cases. Yes? Yeah, so his question is, uh, if I'm using low, if I, if I have low cardinality data, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, lot of, lot of, a lot of unique values or a small number of unique values? Small, small, small number, number of unique small. values. Uh, then uh, is hashing better than sorting? <sighs> hashing usually is always going to be better. Um, Yeah, so so you would have super large partitions that fit memory because you have you would have collisions, but then you can just you do, well see next class you can do recursive partitioning so you can keep dividing it further and further to get it, to get everything out of the fit and disk, so hashing goes going to be better. I think of other scenarios. Isn't it just binary data like just binary like it doesn't matter whether it's binary or not. Isn't it just oh, sorry, sorry. Meaning like li literally like zero and one. Yeah. Uh, so it's like an extreme case. Uh, uh, for ag for, well, I mean, if, if, for aggregations, let me think about this. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if the optimizer knows that it's literally two values, uh, then you, it's almost the optimization of like the heap sort, where you just want to scan through it once and maintain a hash table that has for the two values, right? Yeah. But at some point, there's a trade-off where, like, okay, you do have to do the like, divide and conquer approach. Mm -hmm. So again, I think in that case, I still don't think hashing would do better. Okay. Any other questions? All right. 
Next class, we'll do joins. We'll do nested loop joins, index nested loop join, sort merge join, and hash join. Again, th this is the most important data. This is the most important algorithm you have to do joins. So I'll spend a lot of time going how to optimize and make it go fast. Okay? All right. See you guys. Hit it. Super snake.